Welcome back to our channel. Today, we dive into the dark and interesting world of the Middle Ages, where power was often in the hands of notorious gangsters. In this video, we'll explore the tales of ten of the most terrifying and cruel individuals of the time. 10. Warrant Family Some gangs were simply family members working together to survive, and such was the case with the Warrant family. The Warrants were a group of four siblings and another relative who worked together to cheat the justice system, making a small fortune by the standards of their time. The first record of the Warrants is that three of the siblings, Matilda, Marjorie, and Richard, were accused of receiving stolen goods in 1321, but avoided punishment. The fourth brother was charged again later in the year. There is no way for us to know how much, if anything at all, was stolen in these cases, nor how many other crimes they may have committed that have slipped through the net. However, the family was finally arrested when John Warrant was found guilty of stealing clothing and household utensils worth eight shillings. The average worker's wage in 1331 was three pence a day, and twelve pence was equivalent to a shilling, so eight shillings was approximately one month's wages. John Warrant was hanged. The rest were clearly not deterred, for their greatest exploits were yet to come. In 1325, all four remaining Warrants were in prison for stealing cloth worth sixty shillings. Despite instructions for strong and cruel punishment, which likely meant torture, they again evaded conviction when they were brought before the jury. They get right back to the matter, in 1326, they are acquitted of stealing thirty-two cloths, and just four months later, Two of the sisters are accused and acquitted of stealing forty shillings worth of cloth. Here, the warrants are dropped from the map, having stolen items worth a wage over a year and a half and they escaped, mostly, unscathed. 9. Malcolm Mussard The first mention of Malcolm Mussard is on February 13, 1296, after he and some friends were arrested for trespassing in a royal forest while they were heading to join the king's army in Scotland. He was probably in his early twenties, and this was the first event in a life spent on the wrong side of the law. On his father's death in 1300, Malcolm inherited his lands in Worcestershire, and it was not long before he began selling his swords for profit. In 1304, he and his gang were paid to attack the rectory by the previous tenant, something they would do in their future careers. In the early 1400s, he and his men were accused of many felonies, robberies, and murders in Worcestershire and fled the county to escape justice. It cannot have been long because by 1316, the king had ordered an investigation into the miscellaneous crimes committed by Mussard in both Worcestershire and Warwickshire, although he was pardoned in 1318. Malcolm was arrested in 1323, ostensibly to aid the marcher lords in their rebellion, but he was released in 1326 and officially pardoned for all outlaw crimes in Worcester. Once he was out, he seems to have reverted to his old ways because when Isabella deposed the king in 1327, she ordered him arrested for theft in Worcestershire and Gloucestershire. He was released by the time Isabella was removed from power, and Edward III formally pardoned him in 1330. 8. Folk Fitzwarren Not all medieval men who ended up living the life of outlaws did so by choice. Folk Fitzwarren found himself on the wrong side of the king after the latter granted the Whittington estate to a Welshman rather than Folk, for whom he had paid one hundred pounds and whose father had spent his life fighting for it. Folk refused to accept the king's decision and in 1200, he and his brothers William, Philip and John began a guerrilla campaign against the crown, joined by some of the family's tenants and the ambitious young sons of a few knights. They numbered fifty-two in total. The king declared them outlaws, and they continued their campaign against the kingdom for three years, even confronting Hubert de Burgh, whom the king had sent with one hundred soldiers to end their rebellion. The king acquiesced in November 1203, paying Folk 200 marks and granting him the kingship of Whittington. Once his dispute with the king was settled, 
Folk happily returned to the life of an ordinary landed gentry in England and lived until 1258, by which point he must have been very old, especially at that time. He was clearly highly respected in later life, because the King of England trusted him to mediate disputes and truces in Wales on several occasions after 1230. 7. Fulfill. In most cases, only the landowner's eldest son would inherit any of his property. Any other sons usually join the knight's entourage in search of glory and fortune, either in the form of rewards for bravery or ransom for the capture of another noble. But some turn to crime, as was the case with the Fulville family. The eldest son, John Fulville, lived the normal life of a nobleman, rarely getting involved in the antics of his younger brothers. But the other Fulfills, Eustace, Robert, Walter, and Richard, worked together as a band of violent mercenaries. They often worked outside the law, or took matters into their own hands, especially when their families were at stake. For example, in 1326, when Roger de Baylor, Baron of the Exchequer, made threats against the Fulville family, Eustace led a band of fifty men who captured and killed him on the road. A warrant was issued for their arrest, and they fled to join Queen Isabella's army on the continent, where they were gathering to depose the king. The Fulvilles fought in the queen's army, and when they succeeded in taking over the kingdom, they were pardoned. Upon their return to England, they operated as a gang of hired thugs, committing acts of violence on behalf of people who wanted to preserve their reputations. They initially targeted the lands of de Bailier, who had wronged them in the past, but they were also roaming the country openly armed and holding travellers on the road for ransom. After stealing animals from the estate of Henry de Beaumont, they were once again wanted for arrest, this time by the corrupt magistrate Richard Willoughby. However, instead of submitting to imprisonment, they arrested the judge and ransomed him for 1,300 marks, a ridiculous sum at the time. The arrest of a royal representative was unprecedented, and they were wanted. However, they allied themselves with the notorious Coatrell gang and together roamed Derbyshire openly armed, causing trouble and threatening travellers. Fortunately for them, Edward III was at war and in desperate need of warriors. He did not have the means to confront the gangsters, but he could employ them. The Fulvilles happily joined the English army and fought for Edward against the Scots during 1337 and 1338, receiving a full pardon in return. They served no sentence for their crimes. 6. John Fitzwalter John Fitzwalter, a powerful Essex man and relative of the venerable de Clare family, is the embodiment of medieval noble privilege. He effectively treated Essex as his personal kingdom and was too powerful for the king to bring him to justice. He first appears as part of a gang that broke into John de Seagrave's garden, hunting, taking his animals and causing damage in 1340. It was not long before he terrorized Essex with his own gang, he engages in cattle theft, extortion, and taking goods from merchants without payment. He often refused to pay any debts or rents he owed. Because of his power and influence, even the royal judges simply refused to bring cases against him. Matters came to a head when men from Colchester broke into one of his gardens, looted it, damaged it, and killed one of his men, perhaps in retaliation for his abusive behavior. Fitzwalter used all the force he could muster against the city, taking legal action, empaneling a jury against them, and assaulting jurors who did not support him, and laying siege to the city preventing people from entering or leaving. He and his gang members even armed themselves with wooden beams from the houses they destroyed and threatened passers-by. Justice finally caught up with him in 1351, when the king ordered the formation of a peace commission to investigate his crimes. The king issued a warrant for his arrest, Fitzwalter was detained in the Tower of London for a year, and his entire property was confiscated. However, he was eventually released and a royal pardon was issued. He was ordered to pay a fine of £847, an amount so large that most lower knights would never earn that much in their lifetime. His criminal activities end there. 
he duly paid the fine in annual increments until his death ten years later. 5. Dispensers. The dispensers were worse than ordinary criminals in the Middle Ages. They were cunning and ambitious, and at the height of their power, they held sway over the King of England. They used their positions in the royal court to bully people and usurp their money and lands until they became the most powerful men in England. It took a civil war to break their grip on the kingdom. In 1317, Hugh Dispenser the Younger was chosen to be the royal chamberlain, an extremely powerful position because the chamberlain controlled access to the king. Edward II was known for his favorites, and Hugh became close to the king. By 1320, he was Edward's closest confidant, other than his wife Isabella. Now that his position was secure, he began to manipulate the king and the power he held to extract people's lands and titles at an astonishing rate. Dispenser so alarmed the other nobles that by 1321, the kingdom was in open civil war, with rebels demanding restrictions on royal power and the removal of Dispenser. Unfortunately for them, they were crushed at the Battle of Boroughbridge, opening the door to four years of unrestrained royal rule, and by extension Dispenser. Hugh Dispenser and his father systematically abused royal power to seize the lands of other landowners, often by imprisoning them until they agreed to abandon the charter. They also perverted the king's opinion against their great enemies, Roger Mortimer, de Moore, and Audley, and directed the royal authority against them, thus strengthening their own power. They also had complete control over the king, not allowing him to meet anyone else, not even his wife, unless one of them was also present. The dispenser's corruption turned the entire kingdom against them and injured the monarchy so badly that when the king's wife, Isabella, landed in England with an army, after unsuccessfully asking Edward to get rid of the dispensers, Edward's reign with them came to an end. The only people who sided with the king in the end were Dispenser and their allies, and within two months of Isabella's arrival, he and Dispenser were captured and imprisoned. The elder Dispenser was cut into pieces and fed to dogs, while Hugh was hanged from a height of fifteen meters, fifty feet, while forced to wearing his coat of arms upside down he was then castrated and disemboweled. 4. Adam the Leper Many bandit groups plague rural areas, but towns and cities can also be havens for medieval gangs. On page 245 of the History of Crime in England is a record of the exploits of a gang leader called Adam the Leper. A merchant working for Queen Philippa of Hainaut, wife of Edward III, was carrying some jewels on her behalf at his home in London. Adam the Leprechaun, whose gang operates in the area, somehow discovered that he had the jewels and led the gang to the merchant's house after dark, cornering him and demanding that he hand over the jewels. When the merchant refused, the gangsters set fire to the house and burned it to the ground, taking the treasure anyway. Not much is known about Adam the leper, except that he appears to have gotten away with it and lived for another twenty years. He was likely the head of an urban street gang that used to carry out robberies such as this, most of which are not recorded because they did not directly involve important nobles or royalty. 3. Roger Godbird, CA 1245-1276 Roger Godbird is one of the people believed to be the inspiration behind the legend of Robin Hood. In some ways, he certainly fits the bill, running as an outlaw around Sherwood Forest and being captured and imprisoned by the Sheriff of Nottingham. However, he is very different from the legendary Robin Hood in many ways. One of the earliest accounts featuring Roger is a court case in which he was accused of unlawfully assaulting one of his tenants. According to the court, Jordan had granted Le Fleming a ten-year lease on his mansion at Swannington, but forcibly evicted him after only a year, taking some of Le Fleming's property as he did so. He was accused of poaching venison in Sherwood Forest in 1264. Two years later, in 1266, he resurfaced, this time taking a charter, land deed, at Sword Point from the priory at Garandon, which he appears to have been leasing to him. Of them, and then forced them to sign a document forgiving him for that. However, later that year, 
he received a pardon from the king for all his past crimes, apparently due to his good behavior. Whatever the reason for Roger's pardon, it was clearly misplaced, because he had been accused of committing a robbery in the year 1270. By this time, he was apparently the leader of a band of outlaws who lived around Sherwood Forest. He was in prison at Nottingham Castle but appears to have escaped with the help of a knight called Richard Foliot, who was harboring Roger and his men. Roger, whom Reginald de Grey, the mayor of Nottingham at the time, called the leader of the outlaws of Leicester, Nottingham and Wiltshire, was imprisoned at Bridgenorth Castle in 1272 and put on trial in 1275, he tried to defend himself by showing them the royal pardon he had received almost a decade earlier, and argued that he had committed no crime since. It is not known whether this succeeded, as some accounts say he died in prison the following year, while others suggest he was released and lived for up to two more decades. 2. Reptiles In many ways, the Coterals were similar to the Falvilles, operating at the same time and in roughly the same area, the two gangs worked together in kidnapping and ransoming Richard Willoughby, who was sent by a royal judge to convict them. Led by James Cottrell and his brothers Nicholas and John, they were most likely the sons of Ralph Cottrell, who owned land in Derbyshire. They first appear fighting in the Earl of Lancaster's army during his 1322 rebellion against the king. King Edward II lost power in the region in the final years of his reign, giving the gang room to grow. They were protected by the chiefs of Lichfield, and were virtually untouchable. By 1330, they had raided one of the estates of Henry Lancaster, who was one of the most powerful men in the kingdom and a relative of the king, and were wanted. On charges of murder. They had already formed an association of criminals operating throughout much of Derbyshire and Nottinghamshire, engaged in systematic extortion and theft. Unusually, they also enjoyed the protection of Queen Philippa, who helped James Cotterell purchase his own land in 1332, at the height of their criminal activities. The Royal Commission ordered to investigate their crimes was abruptly interrupted when war broke out between England and Scotland, and in 1338, the Cotterells were listed on a summons to join the Royal Army in Flanders. The Coterals happily took the opportunity to join the king's army and turned away from their life of crime. They were officially pardoned for their crimes in 1351, by which time James was working as a tax collector at Linton Abbey, and his brother Nicholas was a royal bailiff. The date of James Cottrell's death is ultimately unknown, but the last record of him reveals that he owed more than £100 to a gang. Fulfill. 1. Johnny Armstrong. The raider and gentleman John Armstrong, known as Johnny in the poem written about him after his death, was a bandit and gang leader. Armstrong maintained two forts in the disputed land between England and Scotland and used them as a base from which to harass and plunder settlements in both northern England and southern Scotland for ten years between 1520 and 1530. He and his organized gang blackmailed villages and towns that were unable to do so. To protect themselves and escape with their animals and possessions, or just burn their homes, when they refused to pay. Although he had an extensive criminal record, he was officially a subordinate of the Scottish Lord of the West March, Lord Maxwell, who refused to punish him for his actions when asked to do so by the English guards. Eventually, the English Lord Dacre took matters into his own hands, leading an army to burn Armstrong's property at Cannonby. Through political pressure, the English convinced Lord Angus to declare Johnny and his band outlaws, although Angus's efforts to raise an army to overthrow him failed as he struggled to find on volunteers, fortune turned against Armstrong in 1530, when James V became King of Scotland. Determined to rid the countryside of bandits, he tricked Armstrong into meeting him. The king hanged Armstrong and his twenty-four followers, rejecting Armstrong's pleas for mercy, even after Armstrong said he would make all men in northern England pay him their annual rent. Thank you for joining us on this journey back in time to explore the ten notorious gangsters of the Middle Ages. Make sure you like this video, subscribe to our channel, and hit the notification bell to stay tuned for more historical adventures.